This episode is sponsored by the Pittsburgh Foundation and the Heinz Endowment in reception of the Advancing Black Arts in Pittsburgh grant and residency hosted by the Pittsburgh Glass Center. The city of Pittsburgh is known for its rich contributions to the canon of black cultural creativity. Cultural experiences and creative innovations have always reflected the expressions and imaginations of people from the African diaspora. The Advancing Black Arts in Pittsburgh program is where access and opportunity connect with the Pittsburgh artists who are thriving in their creative process as a means and a way of life. Advancing Black Arts in Pittsburgh is a joint grant-making program created and managed through the partnership between the Pittsburgh Foundation and the Heinz Endowments. The program is committed to helping create a vibrant cultural life in Pittsburgh and the region. Taming Lightning is supported by the Pittsburgh Glass Center, who encouraged my exploration, research, and development of a space for plasma and neon sculpture. The Pittsburgh Glass Center is a nonprofit, public access school, gallery, and state of the art glass studio dedicated to teaching, creating, and promoting glass art. World renowned artists come from all over to make glass art. People interested in learning more about glass come here to take classes, explore contemporary art gallery, and watch live glass demonstrations. As one of the top glass art centers in the world, we pride ourselves on providing exceptional resources and instruction to expand the skills and knowledge of our students and artists. We strive to foster a new generation of glass artists and enthusiasts here in the Pittsburgh region. The Pittsburgh Glass Center is an important arts organization in Pittsburgh that is helping the city connect its history as a major producer in glass to its creative future through the innovative use of glass as art. Glass art. We teach it, we create it, we promote it. We support those who make it. If you're interested in plasma and want to get hands-on experience with this unique medium, I will be teaching two classes at PGC this summer along with Ed Kirshner and Pat Collentine. From June 22nd to the 26th of 2020, Ed and myself will run the Plasma Vessels Using Glass Solder class, where you can learn how to use the unique soldering technique to repurpose existing glass objects into beautiful plasma artworks. This class is open to all skill levels, from beginner to expert. And from August 3rd through the 7th, with Pat, we will be teaching the class It's All About the Light, a class for beginners exploring and expanding ways to make vessels for plasma in the hot shop. Registration for summer classes has begun, kicking off with the early bird rate of $800 if paid before February 1st. Fees increase to $850 on February 1st and will rise to the full rate of $900 on April 15th. Starting this summer, discounts such as the membership discount are not applicable. If you know you would like to take these or any of the other classes we offer, take advantage of the early bird registration price. For more information, please check us out on the web at www.pittsburghglasscenter.org or call our studio at 412-365-2145. I'd like to mention a support option for Taming Lightning, which is coffee. That's ko-fi.com slash Lightning. With this, you're basically donating or giving a tip at the cost of a $3 cup of coffee based on how you think I'm doing, and if you like the project, it's nice and supported. Your donation goes directly to the podcast for means of assisting with audio equipment upgrades, billing or hosting, software and services used in processing the audio, and future travel and professional content. You are by no means obligated to donate, but any support, including commenting and sharing, is appreciated. Welcome back, or welcome to the Taming Lightning Podcast. I'm Percy Eccles II. I'm the creator and host of Taming Lightning, as well as the Emerging Plasma Tech at Pittsburgh Glass Center. Taming Lightning Podcast features a series of conversations to help expand our understanding of plasma and neon light, looking beyond its associations with novelty and sign making, and to explore the potential for noble gases as an artistic medium. 
The intro is Boost by Joachim Karud. Joachim is a Swedish artist who loves to produce chill and happy music and does so for copyright-free use. Be sure to support his music by giving credit when used, subscribing, and or by donation. You can find him on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify. Hello, Lightning Tamers. This is episode number 20. In today's podcast, we have Simone Traub, our marketing intern at the Pittsburgh Glass Center, who was tasked with interviewing myself in regards to teaching a plasma workshop in Sweden with Ed Kirshner and Jaime Guerrero, the Plasma Art Alliance Conference in Boston, and my reception of the Advancing Black Arts in Pittsburgh grant and residency with the Pittsburgh Glass Center. And one more thing before we get going. Um, I've wanted to actually talk about these three subjects for a little while now. And actually, I'm very thankful that the Glass Center has sent someone to interview me because it could have taken a much longer for me to devise my own experiences into this lengthy uh, podcast or writing. So kudos to them, and I hope you guys enjoy. Well, that's all right. So on today's episode of Taming Lightning, I have Simone Traub. Um, she's from the Pittsburgh Glass Center, one of the uh, intern for our marketing. Um, she could tell us a little bit more about herself. I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of new to our position here. No problem, Percy. I mean, I'm also relatively new <laughs> to the Glass Center <laughs> and everything. But yeah, so I'm a student at the University of Pittsburgh, um, but I've been working with the Glass Center um, for a couple months here as um, as like you said, an intern in the marketing department um, under Paige. She's my supervisor. Um, and yeah, I've had a really good time. I've been doing stuff like this, doing stuff for the blog, um, talking to artists and, you know, helping set up the exhibition, writing whatever Paige wants <laughs> me to write. So doing a lot of different stuff, um, getting to know everyone and having a really good time. So yeah, that's me. So what was it about the, the Pittsburgh Glass Center that, that brought you to kind of as one of the spaces for your internship? Um, well, I liked that it was a local space. Um, I live in Highland Park, so it's pretty close to where I live. Oh, so um, you're not too far from here then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I just <laughs> catch the bus over like every day. I could probably walk, but now it's kind of cold. Yeah, so yeah. yeah um, I liked that it was local, and I... I really like the idea of the Glass Center sort of bringing people from the local community into the Glass Center and into the whole um, glass making world. I think that's really cool um, and something I could really get behind. So, yeah, and did you already have like an interest in art? Yeah, so um, I should probably go back and explain. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, um, like I said, I go to the University of Pittsburgh and my major is history, but my minor is museum studies. So the museum studies program at Pitt is a subdivision of the history of art and architecture program mm -hmm. there. So obviously I've done a lot of stuff related to that, you know, like um, art related classes, art history related classes. Um, and they actually, they also help facilitate like the internship program there. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it thanks to them that I ended up at the Glass Center and all that too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, I've always been interested in art ever since I was a little kid my parents would take me to art galleries so yeah and um I guess sort of relating to like how I understand the Glass Center's like mission and like place in the community when mm -hmm. I was in high school um <laughs> not to like be talking about I don't know I don't know maybe like a competing institution well I don't think so but yeah. um I used to go um, a lot to the Union Project to do um, ceramics there. Okay, yeah. Um, and it was really great. It was a really great experience for me um, to take classes there, go to open studio there. So I really, from that experience, I can really appreciate how like local art institutions that offer that sort of stuff can really impact people. So, yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, so today we're kind of going through some questions you had for me. Uh, we're doing... Uh, uh, she's actually writing an article for the Pittsburgh Glass Center's website uh, in regards to my most recent travels out to Sweden. Uh, maybe that's, is that the, particularly the focus here That's today? mostly the focus. Mm -hmm. There are some other questions, um, but a lot of it is about your time in Sweden, yeah. All right, sweet. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to let, uh, you know, Simone take it away from here, and, uh, and we'll be in. Okay, great. Thanks, Percy. <laughs> okay, so I saw, based on your Instagram posts, <laughs> 
that you spent a lot of time at the glass factory mm-hmm. in Boda Glassbrook, or I guess Boda Glassworks. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? Like, what did you do, and how long were you there at that specific place? Yeah, so at the uh, glass factory uh, Boda, which is in uh, Boda Glassbrook, or uh, which is near Costa Boda in Sweden, um, that was our main location for a workshop that Ed Kirshner was teaching. And um, uh, we were there for two weeks. We came in about uh, you know five days early before the class to help set up, um, as it's one of the locations that the Glass Art Society Conference is being set up at for uh, GAS 2020. And so um, we were mainly there. I was invited to be an te- a technical assistant or a teaching assistant for that class, but also to be able to lend a hand in setting things up. Um, so that's uh, mainly the reason why I was out that way. Cool. Um, so where else did you go anywhere else in Sweden? I know that that whole region around Boda Glassbrook is sort of part of a larger like mm-hmm. glass glass blowing, glass making like center in Sweden, like historically and presently. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, that, that area is, uh, has another name, it's referred to as the Glass Kingdom. So there used to be dozens of glass studios there. Now there may be about seven or eight. Um, and the area is about, I think, especially where we're going to have the conference at, it's about 1,500 people in that area. Uh, but when I arrived, I, wanted, I was meeting up with um, Tommy Gustafsholt. Um, he's a neon artist and neon fabricator in uh, Sweden, pretty much the only neon person in all of Scandinavia. And so he's up in uh, Vesteros, where I met him when I flew into Arlanda. And, uh, and so I got to visit his studio, uh, take a look at his setup and meet his crew. Uh, we've been kind of talking since, uh, for me a little bit over two years, since I kind of jumped on the uh, Instagram and stuff like that. And um, he's a big supporter of what I'm doing and, and what people are doing with Neon and with Plasma. So he had offered his hand in also like, taking a road trip with me down to the glass factory. Oh, my God. And uh, <laughs> bringing equipment that we needed to fix up that system. He's been really closely connected to the glass factory. And a lot of the equipment they have down there is from him that he's uh, sold them or provided. So it's really awesome that um, he was willing enough to kind of travel with travel with me and come down and lend his hand and, and, and his uh, expertise. Yeah, that sounds really awesome. <laughs> but I have to say most of my time was really spent down in the glass factory. In that area, you are kind of have to travel about 20, 30 minutes out to get to any location for food or, or okay. restaurants and things like that. So it's kind of isolated. It's out there, um, out there, and I guess in the, in the wilderness of sorts. Um, but after the trip, I got to check out a couple different places as well. Great. <laughs> um, so obviously you talked about a whole bunch of different things you did, um, people you met, but if you had to say, what would you say was the most valuable part of your trip and the most enjoyable part of your trip? I would say the most valuable part of the trip um, was definitely having the opportunity to travel um, and, and learn with Ed Kirshner. So uh, Ed Kirshner is one of my, uh, you know, second closest mentors in this process for plasma he's the one that really invited me out and encouraged me to come out that way to teach the class and so not only just seeing how to work with uh with plasma and these different mixtures and stuff like that how to adapt to different spaces and how to communicate between uh, different people especially if you had to think about financially funding or expenditure for setups or for the future because he's the um one of the financial uh, board advisors for the glass art society conference so he kind of is on that board talking about what moves they should make who they should connect to what should be spent what shouldn't be spent and that was like another kind of professional layer to my um i guess my apprenticeship of sorts <laughs> but um yeah that, that that was definitely the most valuable part of that uh, Besides, I guess, meeting a whole bunch of different people. Always meeting new people is great. Um, and then what was the other question? Um, what would you say was the most enjoyable part, if you had to pick one? It sounds like it was all pretty great, but... I would have to say um, almost post post the class, like post-class where we um, everyone, all the students kind of went home and all that stuff. 
and uh, we uh, I, I traveled out with Jaime, who was one of the other instructors. Right, right, it was right. kind of like this. This workshop was really like a, a blow on glow 2.0. So we took how we set it up at the Glass Center and then transcribed that so that we can you know translate that for uh, Sweden at the Glass Factory. So uh, Jaime, uh, myself, and then one of the students, Ann Wolf, went out to um, Costa Costa Boda. Which is not too far from here. There's the the art, um, the Costa Art Hotel is there, where it's just basically the entire hotel is like a gallery space. Each artist has like their own hallway or floor where they have their art just in the hallways. And, you know, their their um, I'd sad to say their uh, their little bar and restaurant that's there is like glass chairs, glass floor, glass walls, glass lighting, d- table set. It, it's amazing. It's a little bit overwhelming in terms of how much glass they put into that space. Um, but we went out that way to kind of check out the area because we didn't get enough time to just jump away from the class to really explore. And we got to, we met with the other students that was locally. She owns a, a glass studio in um, Olison. And she um, introduced us to uh, Bertil Valen, who um, if, if most people know him here in the glass, at least the glass community as the artist who was doing the large boats. So we pretty much um, took a casting method, the sand casting method, usually used in uh, prior used in metals, and applied that to glass. So you have sand cast glass forms. You're ladle casting hot glass into these forms or inlaid glass pieces. So that's something that he really impacted, I guess, the glass studio movement, uh, studio movement or practice with sand cast glass. And he was just in the studio. He was like grabbing a few screws, went over there, and, and it's like, oh yeah, I'll just introduce you to him. He'll he'll be cool. Like he'll show us a couple things. So he's like, oh, I'm gonna grab a few things. Uh, I need to head back real quick, but you guys can come back with me, and I'll show you my little my studio. I'll show you my latest project. So we got back there, and he's working on something a bit interesting. He's working on uh, doing a new production line, something that kind of puts the human hand back into the glass making. Because uh, I'll try to post this soon, but I, I um, the factory rat was mostly a lot of mold blowing and production. You're moving stage through stage, and the forms are already pretty much there. You just have to kind of complete it by blowing the mold, setting up the heat, and then you know setting it up to be put away. And so for him, he wanted to go back to being more organic. So you have a bottle shape that's kind of shaped by the hand, a little oblong, and not completely symmetrical. It's not made by the mold itself, which is really cool and fun to to hear. So kind of breaking the mold, if I'm going to use a bad pun. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, that sounds really awesome. Um, glad that you got to meet those people. And oh my god, that that hotel <laughs> just sounds so amazing. I can't even like that's so awesome. But yeah, um, another thing I wanted to ask, based on sort of what you've been mentioning about um, adapting, sort of like practices that you might have had at the Glass Center to um, the Glass Factory over in Sweden. How would you say? Um, like how would you say what they the setup that they have there is different um, and how what sort of adaptations do you have to make or things like that if I'm understanding you correctly yeah. so um, the difference between the Pittsburgh Glass Center and Costa Boda uh, Glass Factory is that um, the Glass Factory uh, I'll, I'll start with the Pittsburgh Glass Center Pittsburgh Glass Center does a lot of things um, they are uh, an education facility they are a space for renters to make their work, and they are also a gallery, um, and that's a lot of things in one space, but it's really nicely evenly distributed. They have the space to have all these different pieces be shown there. They have all these different tools and methods of working in glass that are available, and the teaching staff is constantly growing and expanding. Uh, with the Glass Factory Boda, they are mostly an exhibition and museum space. So that's a lot of what they have their, their space invested in. They want to grow and be kind of like this multifaceted place, kind of like the Glass Center. Um, they do have a hot shop, but they don't have as much uh, equipment there. Okay. What's interesting is that the area there is definitely hot shop related. No flame working. If there's casting, they're not really putting that facilities for that. Um, so you have just hot shop glass and it's two, two benches with two uh, heating chambers and a single furnace. 
um, people that come in there, they're usually not really making, you know, art for themselves. They're often renters that are doing production for their the master of their who they work under to produce their design. Or there's sometimes, uh, like the two ladies I met there, the Laboratoriette group, they were doing kind of science and art mixed together. So they wore their lab coats, they brought in scientific glass, and they picked up pieces, and they remade those in hot glass. And so that's that's kind of like the main difference. So when we went in there, we needed certain tools like um, a, a file, a diamond file, or a, um, a carbide blade to kind of score and snap glass. Uh, but they didn't have that. We had an iron file. And now why that's significant here? Uh, so the glass has gone through a lot of different pieces of, gla- of glass they've used for the hot shop, whether it's System 96, Spruce Pine, um, Crystallica, and Glasma before going back to Spruce Pine. They over there have Glasma, and Glasma is a glass that's really great for production. It's crystal optically clear. It's, um, it's a harder glass, so it's scratch resistant. You can't scratch that with iron file. You slide it across iron grating, you're not going to put a scratch on it. And uh, it also sets up really good. So it starts to become more stiff or solid quicker, yet, you know, still workable. So what's that great about that is that, you know, it's work, it works great for their, their blown molds. They set it up, throw in there, blow into it, they get the shape, and don't have to worry about waiting a little extra seconds for that to stiffen up before they can move to the next step. So you think about that, it's it's a glass definitely built for what they've been doing there. Their studio and practice is built for making, you know, smaller items, maybe football to beach ball size, you know. And um, and so when you don't have an iron file, you can't really work the way we were used to, making a clean cut and making a clean snap. So the workarounds for that space evolved kind of not being able to access those tools. We didn't have access to them. And to go out there and search for it, an area that doesn't really have the flame working space, you're not going to find it anytime soon. It would be just wasting their gas. Um, so we, we found something in the, the collection of donated equipment or stuff they found, and we found something that kind of worked, but it still didn't work that well. And then we tried things that they already had there. They had a, a torch that can, you know, hot pop, which is heating um, a piece of glass. using a, So you score a little diamond bit. But then you heat with a piece of glass, and that stress along that line pops off the glass, right? Okay. So they had that stuff that's already in hand, and that kind of worked. And we just kind of worked around with it. Um, other than that, I would say having different torches. So they had large torches used to heat up the glass to shape it. But they don't really use it the way we do. They don't really sculpt the way that you're used to seeing, where people are taking their time to sculpt and put details in. A lot of it is just kind of like an overall shape and really getting the form and, and using a lot of bit work. So, you know, they had these really large torches and being able to find the uh, torch that worked, put them, uh, it took them a couple of days and they found a, a torch that worked but didn't have the uh, European fittings. Oh, right. Oh, so you didn't have European fittings. It was an American torch that someone had in their storage uh, in a shop nearby. And, and we had to kind of retrofit it using an alternative method. So it... In terms of kind of comparing it to before, uh, the Pittsburgh Glass Center, it wasn't that different. I think you had a different culture of people working with different set of skill sets um, based on being more professional in their in their experience. Okay. Thanks, Percy. It sounds like... Sorry, some... long answer. No, 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 no. <laughs> long is good. It's good to have detailed answers. Um, so... How did your experiences um, with sort of like a different um, different type of studio, all these different people, how did your experiences in Sweden influence the type of work you'll be doing back here in Pittsburgh at the Glass Center? Um, so I, I looked at a lot of glass work that they had, and I was really inspired um, by a couple, you know, uh, what do you call it? glassware shapes and way they treated the glass like having a nice thick glass bottom like a thick juicy glass bottom on on the cup is something that they're really into there having a thick piece of glass that's in the bottom and then using a little bit of engraving to to cut in a line or small detail that really accents that entire form that's something that you know it doesn't apply directly to my work but I've been working with the um 
AC um, hotel in Pittsburgh downtown, and I'm kind of pushing a couple of design ideas to help kind of bring Pittsburgh into that specific hotel, mainly because the hotel chain for AC is based on its location. It's kind of the same European vibe. That's really got to be a nice tie-in, you know what I mean? Just like in general, European-inspired design, and then you add an actual European experience into some glassware specific to Pittsburgh. Glass City, Steel City, it, it just it works. But that's not really my own work. That's some ideas I've been looking at for production. Uh, from there, I, I was inspired by a lot of different artists working in that class. There were ten. There was ten people. Ten people, and one of which was not a glass blower at all. This person was a plasma engineer or okay. enthusiast of sorts, who who self taught. So, uh, what I'm bringing back is these ideas and things we played with. It's a very experimental class. So, it, being able to have a a more can you know, I guess more refined uh, surface for a wireless or uh, wireless plasma pieces. So having a plate that can uh, power several pieces at once is a big thing I like to bring back and, and, and bring forward into my work. Um, as well as these different forms people were making. Everyone had something that they worked on for a long time and they just translated what they learned how to make it for plasma. Um, it really inspired me to, to take another look at things I'm familiar with and then just the, seeing how plasma could work and to take that puzzle of figuring out how to make that and learn from those students who, all, who I helped teach but also taught me a lot of different things. Um, that's primarily what it is. It's, it's that, that, the gift of exchange, I suppose. Yeah, that sounds great, Percy. <laughs> um, and then another question about Sweden, and I know you mentioned earlier that they're going to have the 2020 Glass Art Society Conference um and as far as i'm aware you're going to be there doing demos is that correct or yeah that is correct um i i have to say from going there and seeing what they had it gave me a better idea of of what i wanted to do for a demo okay Uh, when i first applied i was really excited about the idea of being able to talk about my podcast and getting the word out about plasma uh, as as i'm also a, a member and affiliate of the plasma art alliance um, so the demo that I'm doing is going to be a hot shop and plasma demo, and the reason why is um, they they wanted they had a really a strong request for neon and plasma demos. So I think there's about four, um, there's four to six demoers, uh, two neon or um, and then maybe two plasma or you know I think it's like fifty fifty on that. And what I wanted to do, which was different than some of the other demonstrations I've seen, and I'm, I'm kind of learning from the past uh, gas conference I went to, which was the one in Murano. Okay. Um, it was really making sure that we can set up the space for for plasma and doing those demos. But I wanted to impart not just a whiz bang, look at that cool thing I made, but more like a tutorial, because people um, uh, working in plasma there's more people that have access to hot shop or flame working but the hot shop is the thing that really needs to make that connection for making your glass airtight so I wanted to demonstrate several ways to make a form so people can take those foundations ask questions and expand on them because um, you know looking back from the glow, blow and glow class at Pittsburgh Glass Center Jaime has not done plasma with, with Ed for a long time and then when he tried to put his own ideas on the plate, he developed new ways to make that happen on the spot. Credit to his his mastery of the glass medium, but also knowing how one or two ways to make something happen, you can start expanding and, and creating new ways to bring uh, plasma to the soft glass world or the furnace glass world. With, with blown glass, you get scale. You get a more immediacy and availability for scale which is kind of important, especially if you're trying to do some demos uh, with a larger crowd, maybe like 50 people. I think that's how many people can fit for that demo. Um, but also just that's a dominant area in Sweden. We want to have pe- people are interested in Sweden, especially uh, Nina Westman in, in the uh, Royal Academy. Uh, one of the, her students and technicians, uh, Joe Anderson, came down for the class. And so there, there's something there we can help 
expand uh, the medium of plasma into glass, where people can take their technical knowledge and start really expanding that. Great. So just now you mentioned the Plasma Art Alliance, um, and I know that recently they had their annual conference in Boston and that you were there. So can you tell me how that experience was for you and also just talk a little about a uh, little bit about how you got involved in the Art Alliance? So uh, the Plasma Art Alliance, um, I think it formed around like 2015. As far as I remember, it's a really recent and upcoming group of uh basically a, a, a community or a collective of artists that are interested in plasma or people interested, even enthusiasts or scientists interested in this phenomenon and our idea is to move towards having that be a part of the sculptural medium of glass because glass is very much tied in the ability to make these illuminated objects. Um, and so I guess it was through... You know, Wayne, Mundy, and Ed, because, I mean, Pat, like, all these three figures, uh, all these figures here have been part of my learning experience in learning about plasma, and I've met them at various uh, parts in the last five years. So um, the, the trip out to Boston was pretty awesome because it was um, kind of like an official meeting to talk about the Plasma Art Alliance, because they had just gotten their website uh, up and running. They have a forum. They have resources now uploaded. And our next step is really to get more people that are interested to sign up and be part of that community. Because I know it's been a big interest, whether it's through Instagram, Facebook groups that we already have established. And um, so that was just uh, an awesome little weekend where we got together, really got to be in the same space and and learn from each other, kind of exchange what we had learned over the years. I mean, people like Ed and Pat, who have known each other for a long time, they got to kind of update what they've been trying in the last, I don't know, like 15 years. Because the last time they talked about what they did in their own practice, it kind of got updated to, okay, this is what I'm doing differently. And this is what I found out differently. Uh, we got to talk to a lot of different people. Um, like, uh, you know, Wayne brought in one of his friends who uh, studies vacuum. He's writing several page papers on it, on high vacuum kind of breaking down uh, the history behind it, but also what we're really trying to achieve with vacuum, because that's very much a, a big part of plasma itself, is being able to pull out the air that you don't want to use and have that used in, and then put in the gas that you want to illuminate. Great. I'm glad you got to have that experience with all those <laughs> people, Percy. Um, but moving a little bit away from your recent travel experiences um can you tell me a little bit a little bit about what you've been working on with the mobile plasma lab um generally the concepts for it how it's coming along and then maybe a little bit how it compares to the glass center's current um hot wheels program yeah so um currently we have a uh, set up for plasma which is like i guess the mobile pal plasma lab um it's a manifold used to evacuate you know vessels or, or or hollow pieces and allows you to put the gas inside of it um, when i uh, designed and made it, it i made it for the use of the glass uh, pittsburgh glass center so that it could be moved from studio to studio um, whether it could be in the flame shop on the first floor or take the elevator and bring it up to the top floor for a hot shop kiln uh, or kiln shop and to be able to have it uh, be part of a, a demonstration space, because you can also use this um, if we were to set up something in the gallery, if I was going to do a show or an exhibition or something like that, I can have that be part of that experience. Or And um, the end goal would be to have that uh, ready for, um, the, the extension of that would be to take it out to different places. Like uh, I've, been, I've definitely been in conversation with uh, the uh, executive director, um, in this conversation about um, taking this lab or making a separate setup that it can take to high schools and kind of connect students um, with their sciences and classes to uh, art in a different way. Um, because everything that you learn in education is about learning to learn and how my background from art with an interest in science and how the right teachers and right curriculums maybe just understand and investigate those things. So bringing that into a space where students can get a demonstration of the kind of infinite possibilities of their practices or their studies so that they can kind of go in with more invigorated um, learning capacity. 
That sounds great. Um, I did also want to ask you about um, your recent um, award from uh, your, you recently received a grant from the Advancing Black Arts uh, Program Foundation um, earlier this year. Mm -hmm. Um, So congratulations, obviously, (laughs) Percy. (laughs) Um, And I just wanted to ask, can you tell us a bit more about your plans relating to that? How does that relate to um, what you're working on? So the uh, Advancing Black Arts in Pittsburgh grant um, was something that uh, I was looking at much earlier before receiving it, and it kind of fell into place perfectly. Um, the thing about writing grants is that um, you can write a whole bunch of them yourself, uh, but sometimes the bigger the money, the more uh, support you actually need to receive that grant. So um, I had written maybe two or three grants prior and didn't get any of that, but I came really close, as they told me. But um, I, I was recommended this grant from the Glass Center, and then I decided we would work together. I, would ask, I asked them using the uh, previous writings I used for the other grants, uh, if they could help me write this grant. And, and what the plan was is to really keep going on for the previous grant I received, which was the Ron Desmond Award for Imagination and Glass. And that was really just kind of like the first step into really getting some things moving forward in plasma for the Pittsburgh Glass Center. And providing a space that would allow people to do this very niche and a very rare um, practice, along with extending that space and to be able to do even neon. Uh, part of what uh, my trip out to Sweden um, was that it allowed me to uh, study a little bit with Tommy and ask questions about his oven process. So not needing a high power transformer made it uh, more applicable for our studio where we can have less of a chance of dangers that you would have to have um, with such a system. You have to have a lot of precaution and and safety setups for that, and, you know, especially in a public space. So uh, my ideas for this grant was to continue uh, and really dig into making it work, just kind of moving forward, really. Um, Kind of, I kind of like to call this like phase two in terms of my like internal scheming and planning. Uh, in which um, this grant will help me go and fully uh, set up that plasma, set up with all the gases and all the features, and really redesign that so that it could be very, um, not only just functional, but aesthetically um, comfortable for people, like approachable. I had a lot of comments from people where they, they're interested, but it's kind of very foreign with all these scientific apparatuses. Um, so that's that's step number one. Uh, step number two of phase two is getting into my work and producing things that I've been kind of thinking about. And this grant allows me to set aside a stipend in which I could take time off and really focus and put down work time in the studio, uh, which is very important for me. And many artists who are trying to set aside time to do their thing among, uh, you know, making the money they need to live. Um, so, and then three is expanding on my knowledge. So number three is taking studio visits and studying short, like, I guess, yeah, taking studio visits with a few select artists and studios where I can kind of expand my knowledge and then continue to build up, um, you know, more content for Taming Lightning. Gotcha. Well, you seem very organized, Percy. And again, (laughs) congratulations. I'm really happy that you have this grant now to be supporting your endeavors going (laughs) forward. Um, I do just have one last or two last questions for you that sort of tie into each other. Um, So what are your goals for your work long term and what do you see as the future of plasma art? So those are two questions I've actually received before um, this interview. Um, And... What I see from my work is just what most artists look for. They're looking for the ability to um, get closer to making the the work they want to. Uh, because plasma is relying on a very airtight vessel, I have to learn a lot of different techniques and approaches. And, and by doing that, I want to be able to help share those knowledges to other people. So uh, the podcast and the work that I try to do in connecting different people or connecting with people is also part of my artistic practice as well. Um, so in the future of Plasma, you know, we're looking at facilities that will be able to fill and learn how to work with this this medium. Um, because first and foremost, 
the only people have available right now is the ability to make using glass. That's that's the top. That's what's available. And there are absolutely like maybe one or two facilities that mess around with plasma. But since it's such a a small field, there's not a lot of knowledge and not a lot of experience in those in those areas. So you know once. We get people the tools to figure out how to make the vessel, which is no different than just applying a few different ideas to what they already do in glass. Um, building those facilities and then expanding on that exploration is the next step. And then the third step is the technology, because in the technology department, the uh, the power supplies or transformers that power these objects to light them up, they're not as refined as neon. They haven't had the commercial success or the kind of necessi- necessity that neon had uh, in which it would have developed well enough to have a variety of different devices for a variety of different sizes, brightnesses, and effects. So we're looking into that in the long term is eventually those devices will be um, produced and will be um, UL listed and certified for uh, museum and and uh, home spaces. Well, thank you, Percy, for bearing with me through all of this and for letting me talk with you and the interview and everything. Um, I definitely learned a lot about you and your work and plasma and all that. So thank you. Yeah, and you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. The outro is The Process by Lakey Inspired. Jordan, a.k.a. Lakey, is a Los Angeles-based artist with the goal of inspiring others to create by sharing positive music around the world. Thus, he works hard to produce music every week for copyright-free use. Be sure to support his music by giving credit when used, subscribing, and or by donation via Patreon. You can find him on Instagram, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify. Thank you for listening to the Taming Lightning Podcast. I'd like to thank Simone Traub, the marketing intern at the Pittsburgh Glass Center, for accepting my suggestion for a podcast recording of the interview for her article. She's done a great job summarizing everything from the interview, so I hope you check that out as well. I'd also like to thank the Pittsburgh Glass Center for the opportunity and for supporting me as a place of research and inspiration. And the Plasma Art Alliance, where I have an access to a well of knowledge and connects me to some amazing and supportive people. Of these people, i like to mention a few. Pat Collentine, who put me on this journey in organizing the inaugural Plasma Art Alliance Conference. Ed Kirshner for providing the opportunity to learn and teach with him in Sweden. Mundy Hepburn for his boundless energy and wisdom in plasma. And Wayne Stradman for laying down the decades of groundwork and endless experimentation. And lastly, my few fellow plasma apprentices, Aaron Ristow and... Harriet Schwarzrock. All this would not have been feasible without the support of the Advancing Black Arts in Pittsburgh grant provided by the Pittsburgh Foundation and the Heinz Endowments. If you'd like to support Taming Lightning, subscribe to the newsletter on www.taminglightning.net or follow on Instagram at Taming Lightning. Other options for support are donations through Coffee, spelled K-O-F-I, dot com slash Taming Lightning where you can donate for the price of a $3 cup of coffee. Links will be provided in the show notes. So feel free to share, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.